It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 264 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 14th of May 2017. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. And Penny Dumsday. Hello. And let's begin first with childhood cancer. Now, the good thing about rare childhood cancers, of course, is that they are rare. Mm. But that also makes them hard to study. You have limited access to tissue samples and therefore you're, un- you're limited in how many treatments you can experiment with. But Penny, while there, are, there may be only a few cases of, say, rhabdomyosarcoma in the population at any one time, if you look back over 100 years of records, you find a great many more samples. And that's what's happened here, isn't it? Yeah, I thought this was fascinating because, again, it's, it's a kind of a way of approaching a problem from a different angle. And some of these cancers, there may only be three or four patients in the whole of the UK where this study was done, for example. So how can you do a clinical trial with four patients? And the point was made that it's, in essence, the treatment regime is almost made up. Like you're, There is no way of really studying what works and what doesn't like there is for more common mm. cancers like breast cancer and so on. So... A different, and what I really like about this is because I I'm not you know completely up to speed on all the genetic techniques, but I do like the the out of the box thinking. And what they've done is sequenced DNA from the genomes of um, samples that were collected from childhood tumors almost a century ago. So this is um, doing a DNA analysis from samples at the. Um, the Great Ormond Street Hospital Institute of Child Health in University College London. And they searched their archive for samples from the 1920s, which is apparently when the terminology used to classify tumours, you can kind of map it on to modern diagnoses, even though this hospital was founded in 1852. So I guess that's a really important point, is there's not much point sequencing something if you don't know what it is, if that makes sense. Sure. Like just yeah. here's a random bit of mutated <laughs> tissue. That doesn't help well, anyone. You know, the vapors or something. Presumably yeah. these samples would also be tied to actual records of, you know, symptoms yeah. that the patient had and things like that. So you can map it out. Yeah, better. so you have, yeah. you have a better idea of what's going on. So they, they were just preserved in um, formaldehyde, but they were able to stain it, um, take out the bits they need, and also do sequencing. So what's interesting is that they, even despite the degraded nature of the sample, they were able to get DNA and sequence genes, and they found cancer-related mutations. So this is interesting. Like, I'm not a cancer researcher. I don't fully understand what this will do i'm guessing it will help them see well what do all these different cancers have in common maybe there's only four kid four children with um a certain cancer around you around know, right now time, around right yeah. now but if you can get a seat you know a hundred maybe they can target drugs to the most common kinds of mutations that um mm. strike these cancers i'm not sure but it is really really fascinating and it's again like i'm sure that well Maybe not, but I'm pretty sure. No, 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 because they had it was in 1920s. I'm gonna say the people who kept those tumor samples had no idea that there'd yeah. be, you know, g- genes. I didn't even know what DNA was. So that yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So I mean, it's just that that idea of just keeping stuff and preparing for it, a future that you just don't quite also, understand. I like the the notion of just storing stuff in case, and yeah. and the idea that. There are so few right now, but over a hundred years, if yeah. every few diagnosis, every time someone is diagnosed with something, you keep some of those samples. 
you yeah. end up being able to trace how has that cancer mm. mutated over a hundred years or something could potentially be a wealth of information. It's a really yeah. cool story. It is. It's. Fa- I thought it was fascinating and. And the other cool thing I like about it was the um, the story. I didn't know about the uh, the Great Ormond Street Hospital, which not long after it opened, nearly closed down because of bankruptcy. And it was only after a donation from Charles Dickens, who, of course, wrote so many stories about childhood hardships and that sort of a thing. So I thought that was kind of cool that it nearly went bankrupt, but was saved at the last minute. Yeah. Well, let's move on. Shane, there's a species of bacteria that seems to use quorum sensing, the ability to detect when other bacteria are nearby, to switch on or off its attacking abilities. And from what I understand of this article in The Atlantic by Ed Yong, that's somehow linked to how it can infect various insects and animals. Is that right? Yeah, um, it's... Yeah, I I did a bit of reading up on this. Um, So, before... The story goes that this back in 2010, <clears throat> a um, a volunteer firefighter, why that information is important, I don't know, um, basically hurt himself while he was gardening and he, his wound became infected. Um, the researcher who discovered the original bacterium, Sodalus glossinidius, which is actually a, um, it's an interest, it, it's a bacterium that lives inside the guts of tsetse flies, of all things. Um, he, the guy who discovered that was sent this man's uh, like fluid sample from his infected wound and Sodalus was actually in it and he thought that's not possible <laughs> because this bug only infects insects. What's going on here? Um, but then it turns out that this organism or its DNA has been found in other wounds since um, and it, so it appears to be a, a like a an environmental organism, but what he's discovered, or what, 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 what I think researchers have um, figured out, is that the intracellular version, or the one that infects or is inside insects, is a different species to the one that is in the environment and can occasionally infect people. Um, and so they've called it Sodalus precaptivus, or precaptivus. So you know, Sodalus before captivity, which I, think I quite like. It's kind of a, it's kind of a cool little use of the um. That's Latin, isn't it? The precaptivus? Yes. I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I should know this because I did bacterial taxonomy, but I've forgotten a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, the, what's interesting about this is that um, this organism seems to be able to, as Ed said, use what they think is quorum sensing to shut down its its ability to kill things. Um, and that's kind of important if you want to become a symbiont. You don't want to kill your host. Um you know, you, you want to live side by side in relative peace. And so what, what it seems to be is that there are certain genes that this organism has that can... So, for example, they know that um, it can infect things like weevils, but it seems to not kill them. However, as soon as you knock out a few genes, you basically knock out that quorum sensing ability and they just grow... Unf- and they grow... Not only do they probably grow unfettered, but they also don't sort of sense the ability to turn off certain genes that would be bad for their host and therefore the weevils die. And I think that's what happens in these cases of these infectious cases as well. Um, I think the actual infection is fairly benign and that's probably a good thing because it wants to stay, stick around. Well, I mean, it's good for the mm-hmm. bacteria anyway because it wants to stick around and sort of stay alive in its host and it doesn't want to kill the host. So I think that's really kind of cool. And I, we've talked about quorum sensing before and it's the idea that, uh, you know, of a bacterial population reaching quorum. But like you know, so like the old town hall meetings where you, you get a certain number of people, and there you, you've got a majority or an ability to, to make certain decisions. Similar kind of idea. It, every bacterium will, will release a certain level of a signal, and when that signal becomes to a certain concentration in the local environment, another the, the, the population will sense this molecule and its concentration, and then will react accordingly. And there are different outcomes of this reaction in some cases it's to you know start behaving in a different way like you know turning on certain genes um and in this case it seems to be that like basically in the case of in in the case of insect infections it will not express certain genes that will destroy chitin for example um yeah so it's it's a bit of a complicated story but and it's doesn't really have any 
you know, application or anything. I just think it's kind of cool. And it's it's one of those... Always good to know more. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And it, it sort of gives you more information about bacterial relationships and relationships with their hosts, etc. So, yeah. So, basically, when it infects an animal and it, it, it does this playing friendly thing where it basically says, I'm not a threat, don't kill me, I'm not a threat... Is, is, is that what it's basically doing? It, it's knocking down its aggressive tendencies in order to uh, play nice so it doesn't get attacked well, by the host body? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, if you, if you want to anthropomorphize it like I do. That, I guess of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be a thing that, you know, it doesn't, it wants to, it's a different strategy. Like some mm-hmm. organisms will have, a, you know, like say, for, you know, taking an extreme case, Ebola, um, its strategy is to basically spread as fast as it can. And, and, mm-hmm. and voraciously as it can. So it will kill its hosts without, you know, it won't care because it, it knows, it, it not, not knows, but it, <laughs> by killing its hosts and infecting rapidly, it will spread across the population. And that's how it propagates itself. Whereas this organism is a bit different. This one will say, well, no, I kind of want to stick around. I don't want to, you know, being passed between body to body is a bit of a pain. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'd much rather have a stable relationship here. And, it, you know, both, both, both strategies make sense, I guess. And that's what it, this one seems to do. And I think that in, in the case of the one that infects um, the flies, the um, Sodalus glossinidius, that's a different species again. I think it's lost a lot of its genes that – because I, I don't think that organism can live outside of an insect. And certain organisms so – certain bacteria have done that. They have become symbionts with other, other organisms – and they have essentially lost genes that would make them free living. And the payoff of that is that they're nice and safe inside their host and they don't need to live outside anymore. Whereas this organism is different. This is definitely a free living organism, but it can infect other organisms. But it doesn't have the same kind of requirement to live inside a host. But it will if it needs to, if you know what I mean. So Yeah. The other cool thing I liked about this story is... Uh, as you said, normally this bacteria infects uh, grain weevils without harming them. And Ed Yong has used the line, but if Enomoto injected the insects yes. with a mutant strain that doesn't have the quorum sensing gene, they become the lesser of two weevils. I know. I know. You've got to love that wordplay. <laughs> yeah, love. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Come on, he's having fun with the language. Yes, I guess he is. <laughs> All right. Once again, we've got to go back and take another look at the great Stradivarius debate. For the third time since 2012, a study has been done looking into whether the famous violins made in the early 18th century are actually better than their modern counterparts. So, Penny, can we finally put this to bed once and for all? Are they any better? Well, look, not <laughs> according to <laughs> no, this latest okay, study, no, on. they're not. They're not better. Um, but I think the the article that I read about this in Nature was really saying, well, you know, maybe there was some questions that science was not meant to answer because <laughs> there's been a lot of things like, oh, okay, you know, you, you get people in a soundproof room and play them a Stradivarius and a new modern violin and everyone prefers a modern violin but, you know, those aren't the right conditions and then, you know, you get a blindfolded violinist to play different ones in a concert hall because they were designed for concert hall conditions and people still prefer the modern violin but, oh, maybe that's because, you know, viol- you know, really good violinists get to know their violin and in the end I think... What I found interesting was perhaps it actually doesn't matter. So this latest study has found that essentially everyone prefers the sound of a modern violin, um, including a violinist, a violin maker, a composer, a music critic, you know. <laughs> Some kid right. from down the street. And this is in a concert hall. So, so, so basically these, these priceless yeah. violins sound worse. Than, oh, it's, it's brilliant. I love it. Well, <laughs> I'm guessing that, you know, worse is a question of... Yeah, I know. It's subjective. Yeah, subject. So that, you know, yeah. and this was with solo or with an orchestra, and these were expert players in concert halls. And everyone thought, well, yeah, the new instruments projected their sound better and they were preferred. But I guess the other thing is, you know, it is interesting to know, I guess, what makes a violin play well, and that's 
of relevance to people who develop music, mu- um, musical instruments. But I think also, I mean, art and taste and everything, there's something about it that really transcends what is better and what is good and it just comes down to our emotional response. I mean, I'm sure yeah. that people have a favourite guitar with a special sticker on it or someone touched it. I mean, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I think Shane particularly knows what you I, mean. <laughs> Shane, Shane has how many hundred guitars do you have? I don't have ugh, look, I don't even have I, – I, I, it doesn't even break into the double digits, mate. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. You've only got so, the two hands, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we all have our emotional things that um, mm. are special to us and perhaps for people in the music world – that sense of having a Stradivarius violin, that connection to history is yeah. something that you actually can't measure and value. And I think someone said, um, I'm sure we've talked about a study where if you're told that wine is expensive, mm-hmm. you enjoy it more, mm-hmm. even if it's just two yep. buck chuck from, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh- but no, that's absolutely right. It's, yeah. it's a, an emotional uh, perception mm. that we uh, imbue in an object. Um, and I think also with the violins, it's not just about the sound. I think there's actually mm. something kind of nice about the craftsmanship, the beauty with which these are made. The fact that, you know, this was a tree that was probably in a forest for 200 years before it was carved down into a masterpiece of... Uh, the instrument at its time and it's that's pretty cool I think the history and the beauty is as much a part of what makes a Stradivarius so impressive as the actual sound which is yeah that's what I was trying to say (laughs) (laughs) thank you for expressing it much more clearly that's all right yeah Uh, it's also a subjective thing of course and beauty is always in the eye of the beholder but Mm. I'm not going to pay four million dollars for one like many people well yeah Seem and, 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 how, and how much are they? Are they do they reach oh. the millions of these things? Oh yeah. Or is it? They do. Yeah. Um, the last well, no. I heard was one that was sold for uh, three point six million in twenty ten. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So this this kind of like as Ed has um, you know inferred, I'm a guitar player, and I have a certain preference for certain guitars, and I would love to get, um, for example, a Gibson Les Paul that was made in the fifties. I'd love it because it's a piece of history. It was it was one of the, you know, they're beautiful instruments. They sound amazing. But do they sound good enough for me to pay up, up upwards of now $50,000? Whoa. No. No. And it's purely a it's purely a thing of, you know, this was the <laughs> this was a perception thing, you know, these were made back then, they were the first of their kind. Um this is where the Gibson factory and Les Paul the player managed to perfect the formula and these things are now considered, you know, sort of the the holy grail of Gibson Les Paul instruments. But, you know, if I had $50,000 sitting around <laughs> in my bank account, I probably wouldn't spend it on a guitar even though I'd love it. So, And I think that's also it, just the value. Like some yeah. people might spend that on a car mm. or on a holiday. Or a down payment of a house or something. Yeah, you know, like it's, it's, and, it's, yeah. and other people go, oh, my God, they spent it on a car. Who buys a $50,000 car? Yeah. I could buy a $500 car, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if you bought a $500 car. It's been a while you since you've get... been car shopping, hasn't yeah. it, Penny? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm. No, I think it's good that we now have pretty much f- – although – I was going to say that we've pretty much put that story to bed, but the author uh, of one of the authors of the paper does say that <laughs> just as in all the other experiments, mm. someone's going to be pointing out the yeah. flaw in this. It's oh, not quite the you same. You've got to let the say. bows wait for half an hour to acclimatize and stuff. And look, it, it might also be something along the lines of it, it, it might not even, I haven't read the article to be honest. Um, but it might not be anything to do with the volume or the projection. It might be the certain quality of the sound that it gives mm. that certain people prefer. And or that mm. again, the perception is because it's a Stradivarius, it will sound better. But I'm guessing that the sound frequencies it gives off is probably are probably a little bit different to your modern violins because you know, the, the the way a violin makes noise is a whole combination of things, such as how old the wood is, you know, um, and even the person playing it. Like, you know, the, the different technique, it's all very subtle, but I'm sure it's there. So maybe, you know, master violinists 
would prefer to play something like that. And also just the knowledge that you're holding something in your hands yeah. that is that venerable and, you know, that much of a piece of history. That would be enough, I think, to have a certain passion you're playing that you might prefer the sound in the end. I don't know. And, yeah, and, and, and you make a similar argument for what I was talking about with, with the guitars as well. Like it's, it's – it really is in the, in the hands of the yeah, player. Yeah, it's not about – the yeah, the, it's what the player values and the audience yeah. values and that doesn't have to be something that you can measure – in no, terms of sound quality. Which is why I can't believe we've done this three times now. It really should have been something that was done like, yeah, that they should have sort of come to this conclusion the first time around and said, okay, yeah, on every, on every objective measure, these violins sound, modern violins sound better, quote, unquote, but in the end. Or as good. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. Or as good, but in the end, doesn't really bloody matter. You know, it's, anyway. Mm. There is also the, the point that it could be if you're playing a Stradivarius and you know it's a Stradivarius, you play with that little bit more confidence, that little yeah. bit more um, enthusiasm maybe, and it can affect the player as much as it affects the listener. But mm. um, yeah. Also, we're talking about the value. Um, in 2011, uh, a violin from, made in 1721 was sold in London for $15.9 million US. Uh, <laughs> But in 2014, another Stradivarius was put up for auction through Sotheby's uh, with a minimum bid of $45 million. The auction oh. failed to reach its minimum and the violin was not, the viola was not sold. So, oh, so it was a viola. Oh, yeah. A violin. So, the, so there the, you go. There, there are ceilings of how much some people are willing yeah. to pay for right. <laughs> instruments. Yeah. It's, the, it's the whole diminishing returns thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, having, having said that, Something will be sold next year for a hundred million or something, just to prove me wrong. Problem. Okay, Shane. Uh, if there's one thing we've been saying over and over on this show, apart from Stradivarius are not any better than, <laughs> uh, if there's another thing that we've been saying over and over on this show, it's that microbes in our guts play a much bigger role in our lives than just breaking down our food. Now, a new study published in the journal Nature suggests that they may initiate disease in seemingly unrelated organs and completely unexpected ways. In particular, they say our gut bacteria may be linked to brain lesions that can cause strokes. This is complicated and I struggled a little bit reading this article. I won't, I won't lie, I struggled a bit too. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very interesting. It's fascinating actually. Um, it does sort of open up a whole lot of different questions. And it's an, and what this story is is also a very nice sort of it's it's an it's an intersect between microbiology, immunology, um, and neurology, basically, you know, so the three arms coming together. So it's as Ed said, it's a bit complicated, so I'll try to explain it in a way that I understand it as well. Um, certain people have have uh, lesions in their in their um, their blood, the blood vessels in their brain, which can lead to things like bleeding to the brain strokes. Um, and it's fairly, it's fairly rare, but it's not, it's, the, the outcomes can be quite disastrous. Um, there aren't really a lot of options for people who have this apart from, you know, surgery and apparently palliative care. And it can affect young people too. Like it, it affects all ages. So it's not a nice thing. Um, they've, researchers have identified certain genes that will affect this. Um, basically, there are certain mutations in these genes that will essentially cause the, from what I understand, is the blood-brain barrier to, for cells in that barrier to grow abnormally and therefore lead to these lesions which then lead to the strokes. Unfortunately, um, there's no real way to, there's no, there are no real drugs that are targeting those mutations in those genes. So the prognosis for people who have this is not great. Now, where this study comes in is that they were looking at mice and they were trying to mimic this effect in mice. You know, they would grown up genetically in gene mice that have these lesions. What they noticed was that um, they had a few resistant pups, I think, or mice that they had these lesions in their brains, but they didn't develop the... Well, sorry, sorry. I start again. They, they they had the mutations in the genes, but they didn't have the lesions, so mm -hmm. it didn't lead. To, okay. So yeah, so it wasn't necessarily a, you have the mutation, you will develop the lesion, at least in these mice anyway. What they also noticed was that in these populations, 
if there was a bacterial infection, then these mice would sometimes develop lesions. So there's a little bit of a link here. Um, what they discovered... A, a, a bacterial was, infection of any bacteria or...? Um, or in their abdomens, apparently. So, so if these mice had abscesses in the abdomens, which were actually caused by the injections that they received during the treatment, then they would oh. sometimes develop these lesions, <laughs> which is, you know, you don't, you don't think there's, there should be a link here, but apparently there was one. Um, now, where the gut thing comes in is a little bit of a... <laughs> I think it's a bit of a... Not a leap, but it's a very much a deductive kind of jump, if you want to call it that. They figured out that a certain kind of molecule that is found on the cell walls of certain kinds of bacteria and gut bacteria, this this molecule is called lipopolysaccharide. Um, it's a toxin. It, it can, in normal, in normal um, immune reactions, it will trigger certain things. Like, say, so bacterial infections, that if they occur in the body, one of the first things that happens is lipopolysaccharide will trigger the innate immune system to, to react. So they'll detect this. All your, all your first line immune, system, immune cells will detect this and go, ooh, this is a, this is a warning. This is a trigger. And they will start their arm of the attack. So it, it's a very useful signal. What seems to be happening here is that the lipopolysaccharide is, from what I understand, it's activating another cell um, signal on our cells called toll-like receptor 4, TLR4. And what that seems to do, as soon as this receptor on our cells is activated, then you get this abnormal growth of the cells in the blood-brain barrier, and then you get the lesions. Huh. Yeah. Even if, even if the bacteria and the lipo, what's it, the lipopolysaccharide is detected in the gut. Well, yeah. You know, well, that, that seems to be the idea here. I mean, as I said, they, I, when, I, when I say this is a deductive leap, they didn't. I don't think, I don't think they've made a direct link between the gut bacteria right. and this. That what they've said is, in the presence of lipopolysaccharide, toll-like receptor four is activated, and therefore lesions occur. Right. Okay. So, f- from that, we reason, don't know the physiology or how. It no, happens, they have no they've idea. They've just seen that no. it seems to happen. It seems to happen, and. And so the idea here is that well, if you've got if you and, and as I said, this this is I think the poly, the, the, the LPS lipopolysaccharide they used came from a species of bacterium called Bacteroides fragilis, which is quite a common um, gut organism. It actually makes up one of the I think it's one of the major gut organisms in a lot of different in a lot of different individuals. So there seems to be a link there. But, you know, the, 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 the leap there is well, if you've got if you harbour a large population of Bacteroides in your guts and you have these these genetic genetic mutations that will lead to brain lesions this could affect you this could actually cause these lesions so i think they did some yeah they did they did some more work on this and i think they knocked out the well you know they basically knocked out the microbiomes of these mice and they found that there was a massive drop in the lesions okay. so it does seem to be a ninety-six percent again, drop. Hmm. Yeah. Now this is again in a, a mouse study, a mouse study. So again, and and the, and the researchers go to great pains to sort of emphasise this. This is not necessarily what's happening in humans, though it seems likely. Um, but it's a very interesting link, and it's something that they should look up now. As you know, well, I mean, so there are two arms of this. There's the micro, the microbiology aspect of it, where the gut bacteria is could be causing this. And there's also the effect of your own, your own receptors, toll-like receptor 4, which is also causing this. So there are two possible ways you can go with this. You could say, well, you know, could we maybe deactivate toll-like receptor 4? Um, and that seems to be a bit harder because, you know, that's much more of an in- innate thing. Um, so I think they're, they're getting very excited about the whole idea of can we manipulate the microbiota if that is, in- is indeed what's causing this to then stop these lesions. Right. So, so, or, so can we wipe out all the bacteroides fragilis? Yeah. Or, yeah. And, 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 so and the but idea, what f- flow-on effects will that necessarily have? Do we also need the bacteroides <laughs> fragilis well, for our normal see, gut function? Yeah. Interestingly enough, I don't, not, I'm not sure because I think it would depend on the individual. 
Um, and different individuals' gut bacteria differs wildly. Like certain people won't have any or very few bacterial risk in their in their system. That being said, yeah. there are also other bacteria in the gut that have lipopolysaccharide in in their cell walls. So, right. you know, what do you, what do you target? I think another article I read suggested fecal transplant from an early age. So, you know, as an infant, and therefore you basically wipe out your resident gut bacteria and you introduce new ones that are more benign if they detect these genetic mutations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's my idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all very early days and it's all, you know. Yeah, but it's interesting. It, at least it shows us where some of the paths may be that we need to investigate further down. Mm. And it also shows for me just how horrendously complicated <laughs> this entire system exactly. is and how interconnected it is. And mm. it's not a simple matter of, you know, the targeting one one little, you know, one one um target for one of a better word. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a bit more complicated than uh. you think. Yeah, that's why, and, and that's why I think it took me and Ed a little while to get our heads around this. And I'm, I don't think I have yet, but okay. <laughs> I'm so, closer than I was before. I hope I explained it all right. I'm not sure if I did. But. Uh, look, if, if you're still struggling, maybe uh, check the links in the show notes and <laughs> see if you can do any better. Mm. But uh, I think that's it for now. Uh, as always, more information about everything we talked about uh, is on the web at scienceontop.com/slash two six four. There you can also leave a comment or find our social media info. And if you like the show and you want to help keep us going, check out scienceontop.com slash donate to pledge some money on Patreon. We are super grateful to Ryan James, who just signed up to our space shuttle level, which means he'll get an extra mini episode each month featuring another story that doesn't go on the regular show. So we'll be recording that for you very soon, Ryan, and I really hope you enjoy it. And thank you once again. And thank you for joining me today, Shane and Penny. No worries. No worries, Ed. This episode was edited with copious amounts of tears and wine by Marcos Benavu. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. According to science, picking your nose is actually really good for you. Oh. And it gets better if you eat your slimy boogers. Oh, stop it. They're actually full of good bacteria, oh. which help your teeth. <laughs>